Good morning. Thank you for joining us for the last seminar of the semester, believe it or not. And um, I think we're going to go out on a, a really high note because today we have an expert in childhood uh, cancer, Logan Spector, uh, PhD, uh, professor of uh, professor in the Department of Pediatrics. <coughs> He's the division director of epidemiology and clinical research in the medical school. He's a faculty member of the brain tumor program. <clears throat> he received his PhD in epidemiology in 2002 from Emory. His research focuses on the causes of childhood cancer with a focus on childhood leukemia, bone sarcomas and hepatoblastoma. His work includes both traditional and genetic epidemiologic approaches. He works with colleagues and trainees locally, nationally, and internationally through the University of Minnesota Ch Children's Oncology Group and the Childhood Cancer and Leukemia International Consortium, CLIC, for which he serves as the chair. So I will turn it over to you, Logan. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, so uh, I, just by way of introduction, and that was wonderful, Mark, uh, uh, I have a very bad habit of coming up with lofty titles and ambitious talks. So I, I hope I can fit it all in and, and live up to the, the title and description. And, and just to take care of the burning question that I know everyone has, um, this will be the only mention of Lady Gaga during the talk. So um, uh, uh, I can't do any better in, in giving you a, a quick uh, primer in pediatric cancer than uh, this slide uh, from the American Childhood Cancer Association uh, organization does. Um, and I'm just gonna run through these factoids for you. So cancer is the number one cause of death by disease of children in America and, and in actually in many um, uh, developed nations. Um, approximately one in 285 children will be diagnosed with cancer before their 20th birthday. That translates to almost 16,000 children, um, which we define as zero to 19, according to NCI, uh, each year in the US, which means 40,000 kids in active treatment at a time. Globally, the estimate is about 400,000 children are diagnosed um, worldwide. Sorry, um, 400,000 have cancer. Actually, not all of them are diagnosed. Uh, in the US, 20% of children with cancer will not survive it. The numbers, of course, are much worse in areas of the world that, that don't have our level of treatment. And um, even those who survive can have lifelong after effects, um, including second cancers, heart damage, uh, and early mortality. So um, that's what motivates me to study the question of uh, why do kids get cancer? And when I first arrived at the U, uh, going on almost 20 years. Uh, I, I was uh, of the camp that um, it had to be mostly environmental because children are uniquely vulnerable to uh, the environment. They're both closer to the ground. Uh, they have hand mouth behavior. Um, and, uh, you know, for uh, uh, um, breathing the same amount of air, they'll have, uh, for instance, more toxicants absorbed um, per, uh, per kilogram. Um, although during that same 20 year span, genomics has come to the fore and become a lot more uh, feasible um, to, to, to study. Um, and then finally, I, I've also come to appreciate the role of chance in um, causing cancer. And so today I'm going to give you a, a number of examples of this. But um, first, I just wanna tell you a little bit more about the division. Uh, which is a very um, unique unit, I think, in the, the, um, possibly the country and possibly the world. So far as I know, we're the only division of epidemiology in the Department of Pediatrics. Uh, there are actually se uh, seven of us, um, but four of us concentrate on cancer. Besides me, there's Drs. Jen Pointer, uh, Aaron Marcotte, and Lindsay Williams. And together, we um, take all uh, approaches to understanding why kids get cancer. Um, we also study uh, epidemi you know, clinical epidemiology for outcome of cancer, as well as um, uh, survivorship. But today I'm going to concentrate on etiology. Uh, we use uh, all the available surveillance data from SEER, National Cancer Database, and, and IARC. Uh, we conduct 
large scale record, record linkage studies, uh, which are um, both in Minnesota nationally and internationally. Uh, we've conducted you know, traditional interview based case control studies through the Children's Oncology Group. And then we pool them through uh, the CLIC consortium, which I had. And um, we conduct genomic studies with GWAS, whole exome, and whole genome sequencing, um, as well as I should have put uh, increasingly um, methylation uh, as a marker of exposure as well. And um, regarding the last part, our, our enterprise has grown uh, so large that I've uh, formed early last year the Childhood Cancer Genomics Group to kind of coalesce um, talent uh, on, on the uh, genomic data sets that we have. So besides the four of us in my division, we have uh, quite a few collaborators from around the university, including in uh, epidemiology. Heather Nelson is a close collaborator uh, in the School of Public Health, uh, especially biostatistics, uh, Zhao Li Basu, Bei Hua Guan, Tian Zong Yang, uh, in the med school, Nathan Pankratz from lab medicine, and then um, in pediatrics, the, the Hemonc division, Bo Weber and, and David Largaspada help us model uh, or do post GWAS or post uh, sequencing studies uh, for function. Um, I also like to highlight uh, doctors Lauren Mills and Andy Rudusky, who are um, our uh, staff members who are um, involved in bio, bioinformatics and, and population genetics. So um, although I think that uh, studying pediatric cancer is uh, urgent because they are children and have lifelong effects, even if they survive, uh, to put it in context, pediatric cancer is only about 1% of the total cancer burden um, in the US. And um, even within uh, the total cancer, there's a substantial amount of, uh, of diversity of tumors. Um, and as you can see, the distribution changes over the um, pediatric lifespan. And uh, I also want to note that the, the spectrum of tumors in children is very different than that in adults. In adults, epithelial uh, tumors, also known as carcinomas, predominate. Uh, whereas they're an extremely minor um, portion of pediatric cancers. Instead, we have uh, leukemias and lymphomas uh, from the immune system, um, CNS cancers, um, sarcomas, uh, bone and soft tissue. And then there's a class of cancers uh, called the embryonal cancers that occur almost exclusively uh, in, in um, children that uh, are also uh, fairly frequent. To compound this uh, rarity problem, um, which is obviously not a problem from the societal pr perspective, but for studying it is, um, you know, we uh, epidemiologists can be classified as lumpers or splitters. Um, pediatric cancer epidemiologists are, are now splitters uh, in extremis. So um, this is a graph uh, from a recent uh, review that uh, shows the distribution of cytogenetic or molecular genetic subtype of uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia by age. And you can see there's a, a, a large amount of diversity there. So um, because we think that there is etiologic heterogeneity within uh, leukemia, this makes our job um, uh, quite a bit tougher. Just a little bit more on an international scale, we note that the um, Frequency of uh, incidence of childhood cancer varies quite a bit, and uh, I'll be coming back to this uh, in, in, uh, later in the talk. Um, also, we, we note that there's a, um, a male preponderance of pediatric cancer, which in some cases, uh, Burkitt lymphoma is very profound, uh, and in, in others is, is slighter. There are a few cancers where uh, uh, there's a female preponderance, but uh, in general, the rule is that there are um, longstanding sex disparities in the uh, um, incidence of pediatric cancer, which uh, we are starting to dissect, but uh, I won't touch much further on, uh, on that today. So um, one thing that we know with uh, fair certainty is that pediatric cancer, uh, most cases, sorry, most types, as well as most cases start in utero. 
So we have circumstantial evidence of a couple of types. First is the young age at onset. So a cancer occurring in an infant must have had some induction period. And um, if you think it takes a matter of months, that's necessarily going to put you uh, into the in utero period. Secondly, there's a histologic resemblance to embryonal or fetal cells. I'm not a pathologist, but they tell me that uh, panel A, which is uh, normal liver, fetal liver, uh, resembles hepatoblastoma uh, below. Uh, also, you know, the class of tumors called embryonal tumors are so called because of this histologic resemblance. So the presumption is that these are uh, leftover cells from development that, that never terminally differentiated. We also have uh, proof of principle. So there are case reports of prenatal diagnosis of uh, solid tumors that were found on ultrasound. And then there's an incredibly fascinating story about leukemia and twins and um, backtracking that I'm going to tell you now. So uh, credit here goes to uh, Sir, he's been knighted since, uh, Sir Mel Greaves uh, at the Institute of Cancer Research in London, who, who spent several decades collecting twin pairs um, with uh, childhood leukemia. And um, what you see is for kids who were uh, diagnosed as infants uh, and were twins, there was um, quite a bit of concordance in the, the time of occurrence, suggesting that there was um, uh, whatever mutation was causing the cancer was uh, perhaps sufficient to, to um, to initiate cancer. Whereas uh, kids diagnosed at older ages had uh, quite a bit more lag time between uh, concordant twins, in some cases as much as 10 years, suggesting that uh, at older ages, um, whatever initiated the cancer, uh, there needed to be subsequent cooperating mutations. Um, and this gave rise to the hypothesis that uh, cancer could start in one twin and move to the other. Here we have an um, old Dutch painting which demonstrates twin-twin transfusion syndrome. I'm not a neonatologist or maternal fetal specialist, but that means that this twin got all the blood uh, and this one was anemic. Proof of principle that, uh, that leukemia or blood can switch between um, monozygotic twins. And also, uh, circumstantial evidence that um, pediatric cancer, sorry, leukemia can start in utero. Um, this was then proven by showing that uh, for concordant twins, not only do they both have leukemia, but they have leukemia with the same idiosyncratic breakpoint um, here between the uh, TEL gene and AML1 genes. Um, in other words, the cancer started in one twin and there was an in utero metastasis if you will, to the other twin. Um, this also implies that uh, we could find uh, um, translocations, uh, mutations that cause leukemia in birth samples. Uh, and in fact, uh, there has been a fair amount of uh, research trying to do backtracking. So taking a, a child's idiosyncratic um, cancer genome and looking for signs of it in a birth sample usually cord blood or um, neonatal blood spots. And uh, actually last month, or possibly last week, uh, we published a definitive review on the prenatal origin of childhood leukemia and um, suggested that we are ready to start uh, moving into um, uh, this knowledge into epidemiology and uh, someday potentially into newborn screening. So this graph just shows for different subtypes of leukemia, um, uh, the percent of cases, sorry, the geographic location where people have looked uh, at, at birth samples for um, the presence of pre-leukemic mutations uh, and the percent that were positive. And so the, the TEL-AML1 gene, now known as ETB6 runs one, um, is, is found in uh, 20 to 25 percent of samples um, that were uh, taken at birth. This is not to say that there, there might not be a larger percentage out there, but it could be below the limit of detection. More intriguingly, uh, studies have looked for um, these pre-leukemic mutations in um, unselected healthy newborns, either in cord blood uh, or again in, in um, 
newborn dried blood spots. And um, uh, intriguingly for the most common mutation, uh, the ETV6 RUNX1, uh, up to 5% of newborns, uh, it's detectable. Uh, for TCF3 translocations, uh, it's about half a percent. And we have a pretty wide range uh, of 0.8 to 5% that um, have signs of the KMT2A rearrangement. These might not seem like very high percentages to um, you, but uh, if you think about the incidence of pediatric leukemia, these are uh, magnitudes um, greater uh, uh, occurrence, suggesting that uh, many times more kids uh, have uh, signs of pre-leukemia than ever develop leukemia, and there must be some postnatal initiation. So uh, I also just want to alert you to some work that um, uh, doctors Marcotte and Nelson are getting ready to debut. Um, and that's, whoops, uh, I, I put up the bat signal and somewhere along the way, I, I, I lost the uh, um, text. But uh, BATS is their method for detecting um, translocations in newborn blood spots. It stands for breakpoint agnostic translocation screening. And um, we're very hopeful that this will become a method for conducting epidemiology of pre-leukemia, which is much more common than um, overt leukemia. So um, we do have some hints that uh, pre um, solid cancers, uh, or sorry, precursors to solid cancers may be much more common than uh, overt cancer. So uh, mainly this comes from the study of neuroblastoma, which is a cancer of the sympathetic nervous system with extremely variable um, clinical presentation. And um, neuroblastoma, has uh, aggressive subphenotypes, intermediate and very benign. And in fact, there's one um, type of neuroblastoma called 4S, which actually regresses. So um, a child will be found with a mass. Um, this mass will be throwing off um, uh, uh, catecholamines, um, just like a, a, a um, aggressive tumor but then it, um, it actually disappears. And so the treatment is, is watchful waiting. Because neuroblastoma throws off these catecholamines at high levels, um, it, it was uh, thought that you, perhaps it could be um, useful for screening. And so not many people know this history, at least now, but uh, in the late 80s, early 90s, Minnesota conducted a um, uh, international trial of um, infant screening for um, neuroblastoma. Um, the, the trial condition was in Quebec, which uh, for their own reasons had been um, uh, collecting um, newborn urine for screening purposes. Um, and that was tested for catecholamines in Minnesota was the control condition, uh, roughly the same population. And um, what was found was that uh, the incidence in the Quebec that was screened was uh, two times the incidence in um, Minnesota. However, most of the cases that were found uh, in Quebec uh, over and above uh, the expectation were the regressing kind and may never have come to, uh, come to clinical attention. So uh, screening was abandoned in Quebec as well as in Germany and Japan where it also had been implemented. But the takeaway here is that uh, there almost certainly are uh, tumors or, or relatively indolent tumors that, um, uh, that are out there that don't go detected. And that may be true for other um, solid cancers. So um, environment is what I got into this business to, to look at. And um, it is uh, obviously constrained by the, the um, frequency of uh, or infrequency of childhood cancer. I'd say in general, um, for analytic epidemiology uh, and for the more common cancers, especially leukemia, we have uh, an evidence of absence of, um, of uh, some environmental causes. Uh, I wouldn't say that the environment is um, not, uh, doesn't exert an influence, but as I'll show you, it's, it's not uh, nearly as much as I might've thought when, when I first started in this business. For the more rare tumors, 
where there's a, a really not a lot of uh, analytic epidemiology that's occurred, we have uh, much more of an absence of evidence, at least until the genomic era um, started. So um, last year, along with a colleague at Baylor, Philip Lupo, we uh, gave our impressionistic um, assessment of the, the state of uh, evidence um, for uh, non-genetic risk factors for select childhood cancers. And generally, we, we partition these into those that are um, in preconception or gestational exposures, um, risk factors that are related to uh, birth, and, and then postnatal exposures. And um, something to notice is our, our scale of the size of effect here, uh, kind of uh, call something big if it's greater or equal to uh, relative risk of 1.5. That's because we, we can't credibly say there are any risk factors apart from um, ionizing radiation that uh, cause um, leukemia um, or, or other childhood cancers with um, uh, any reliability. So um, when I say there are no strong risk factors, uh, environmental risk factors for pediatric cancer, uh, it, it's because there are um, uh, up to 50 years of analytic epidemiology, which has uh, failed to turn up uh, any smoking guns, uh, in, including uh, for the most part smoking. So um, now I'm going to dive into um, three case studies, the tumors that I um, study the, the um, most closely, uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, osteosarcoma, and hepatoblastoma, and um, tell you how we've kind of uh, triangulated towards uh, understanding the etiology and the relative contribution of uh, environment, um, genetics, and chance. and um, but first, I, I just want to you know, touch on uh, why we don't have heritability estimates the way that we do for um, adult cancers. So you know, traditionally, heritability was uh, estimated from uh, twin studies, um, but, and, and you compare the concordance between monozygotic and dizygotic twins. But if you're talking about cancers with one in a million incidents, you would need an enormous number of twins uh, uh, in, in order to possibly millions uh, in order to um, find concordant twins, um, you know, uh, in, in order to actually calculate it. So even if, uh, even if the familial risk was 10 or 20 times um, the, the uh, you know, risk in, in singletons, you, you would have to, um, you know, that would be 20 cases per million. The reason that Mel Greaves was able to collect so many uh, twins with um, concordant leukemia is not because of heritability, but because uh, of the uh, intrauterine metastasis. And so uh, it also is the case that heritability estimation in um, twins uh, with leukemia is tainted by the, the fact that the cancer starts in one twin and spreads to the other. So, um, you know, we have uh, made some um, guesses about uh, how much of leukemia is due to um, genetics as opposed to environment from uh, inter and intranational comparisons. Um, and then more recently, of course, we can actually measure um, SNP based heritability directly from uh, genome wide. Uh, array data. So uh, one thing to know about uh, um, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, the incidence varies um, greatly internationally, and we do get um, some, some insight from this. So uh, these are uh, actually 25-year-old data, uh, these slides I made during my dissertation, but uh, the picture hasn't changed, and um, I'm too lazy to, to update them. Uh, but they, they, they still stand. Um, and here I'm just looking at uh, ALL in uh, the, the peak ages, which is uh, zero to four. And um, what you notice is there are a number of populations that have um, the same environment uh, or at least the same country, but uh, very divergent incidence. So in the US, uh, white children have um, several times the risk of uh, ALL as, as black children. 
Um, in New Zealand, uh, non-Maori, meaning mainly European, have higher risk than Maori. Um, in Singapore, uh, ethnic Chinese have uh, a higher risk than um, ethnic Malay. Um, and then interestingly, um, lest you think that that points solely to genetics, um, in the former uh, West Germany, there's a higher rate of lymphoid leukemia than in the former East Germany. Um, although those were more or less the same people with just a political partition for many years that, uh, that caused economic differences. Um, we also have documented that uh, the rate of leukemia, um, sorry, ALL, um, rises with national development. So um, this is from uh, IARC data. Um, there weren't actually many examples of, of countries moving from low to medium HDI or low medium to um, high uh, HDI's human development index. But um, in countries that move from medium to very high human development index, we saw um, uh, uh, average annual percent changes in the two to 3% range, um, and then uh, from high to very high human development index. Uh, it was uh, cancer incidence was rising, uh, albeit not as fast. Um, I want to add that these countries were grouped by their economic change and not by uh, region. So um, they were you know, quite disparate. So, uh, you know, for instance, Dubai and Uruguay didn't have much in common uh, other than the fact that they both were developing over that era. But um, notwithstanding that those uh, data show us uh, some possibility of, um, uh, of environment uh, causing um, or influencing the risk of childhood ALL, um, we also have some very durable differences in incidence uh, despite uh, very disparate environments. And so the, the, the most um, obvious one is between, um, uh, uh, sorry, is, is uh, the low incidence of ALL both in Africa and in the African diaspora. So, um, you know, in Africa, there's concern that the um, there may be an undercount, but there are now gold standard IARC approved uh, registries, which confirm a very low rate of uh, ALL. And um, also of note uh, in Jamaica, which is pop populated mainly by the um, African diaspora, the rate is um, almost the same as in um, US African American children. And uh, this just demonstrates from SEER data from an upcoming paper of ours that um, there's a profoundly different uh, and lower rate in African-American children compared to, to white or actually um, any other ethnicity. And um, as we realized that uh, the weight of um, potential environmental exposure um, falls more heavily on African-American children, we started to think about um, what, what that means. So uh, here I um, put various um, exposures and these are uh, the odds ratios that have um, developed out of uh, meta-analysis. And um, you can see that th there's only one pesticides, which is actually a low prevalence exposure, but um, almost to a, a uh, factor, the um, uh, African-American children have a, a higher burden of exposure. Um, and so uh, the question is then, if they have a higher burden of exposure to putative risk factors for ALL, how is it that they have less than half the risk uh, uh, of ALL as in um, uh, other ancestries? And um, that, that led us to, to think that um, th there may well be some genetic factor. Also, we looked in SEER, which has uh, made available a special file where you can look at uh, small area census tract socioeconomic status. And um, what we noticed was that uh, comparing the, the ratio of, of rates in uh, white and black children at each um, level of uh, socioeconomic position, uh, we have more or less the same uh, relative risk. And so if you think of SES as the 
compilation of all exposures and behaviors, um, even accounting for that uh, in, in all strata of uh, economics, uh, there is a um, profound and noticeable difference in, in um, risk between um, black children and white. Uh, I don't have time to go into what the findings comparing um, Latino and, and Asian children to white, uh, but we found interesting differences there as well. What we also know, and this is not my work, but uh, colleagues at, uh, in London and, and at St. Jude, uh, is that um, at least in uh, children of European ancestry, um, polygenic risk for uh, ALL uh, is very strong. So here you see a relative risk of 4.7, but that's compared to the median polygenic risk. If you're comparing from the, the lowest end to the highest end, it's actually a tenfold risk. And this is a score based on uh, maybe 15 or 16 um, SNPs that have been discovered in GWAS. I just wanna contrast that with um, adult cancers. There's uh, roughly 300 uh, prostate cancer um, SNPs that combined uh, may um, tell you about a, a three or four fold risk in, um, in prostate cancer. And so uh, the first surprising thing about uh, childhood cancer, at least ALL, is that uh, common variation has a far stronger association with, um, uh, with uh, cancer than um, in adults. Also, this is hot off the presses. Uh, it's a uh, um, not my work, but a colleague at USC, um, showing that uh, genetically predicted uh, lymphocyte uh, count, as well as the lymphocyte to monocyte ratio, uh, is related to the um, uh, risk of, of ALL. All right, so what has this to do with the, the rate difference between um, uh, uh, black and white children? Well, uh, that's the question that we set out to ask. Um, so here you have the, the kind of top six hits for GWAS hits for um, ALL. And we compared this to the um, frequency of, of these the risk alleles in um, uh, thousand genomes. And what you see is uh, for some of these uh, GWAS hits, the um, alleles are moderately more frequent in um, uh, or white children, um, but for others, they're uh, actually much more common in, in um, African populations. And so it, it doesn't seem likely that um, these um, SNPs could be explaining the uh, a profound difference in rates. Um, and so we initiated the um, uh, Admiral study to do this sort of comparative uh, genetics. Here you have um, uh, GWAS that we generated, um, which, really recapitulates prior findings. This is the data in um, white children. And uh, we see all the previously known um, SNPs and peaks that we expected. We also did the first GWAS uh, in African-American children, albeit our sample size was about uh, five or 600 children as opposed to um, 5,000 in the, um, in the um, uh, European GWAS. And uh, we see the same hits uh, in IKZF1 and uh, ARID5B uh, that reach genome-wide significance. And then a number of these that are floating below are, um, are the same hits that you see in um, white children. And just to draw this home, uh, we compared the effect size in um, our uh, sample of African-American children to uh, published GWAS. Uh, as well as the, the white children to publish GWAS. And what we see is that um, regardless of uh, the significance, so si significant hits in red, uh, ones that didn't reach genome-wide significance in blue, um, we, we saw more or less the same effect size. And when we put these together in a, into a polygenic score, if anything, we found that um, the African-American children actually had a, a higher uh, average polygenic score, which is um, a, obviously very puzzling because uh, the, the rate is durably um, quite a bit less in, in any environment. We further, uh, whoops, um, 
We further uh, did SNP-based heritability estimates, and to our surprise, uh, we got um, nearly 30% of the genetic variance in um, European children is due to common SNPs measured on the array. Um, but in African American children, the, the heritability was half, and this was uh, statistically significantly different. And so, um, putting the evidence together to date, we have um, very similar polygenic architecture of risk in um, uh, white children and, and black, um, but we have very different heritability estimates. And consequently, my attention has now moved towards structural variation in the genome, um, meaning that uh, there, there may be copy number variants or um, other things that, that we need to look for. And um, so uh, the second part of this study is to conduct admixture mapping. In other words, to find the, the um, loci that are inherited from one continental ancestry or the other. And um, the, the nice thing about this technique is it will potentially show us um, fixed loci, which can't be detected in, in GWAS. So stay tuned for, for this um, study to, as it develops. So um, I'll move on to osteosarcoma, which is a very rare uh, bone cancer, about 400 kids a year are diagnosed. And um, the most uh, obvious risk factor for um, osteosarcoma is age. And what we know is that the um, incidence of osteosarcoma coincides uh, very neatly with um, the pubertal growth spurt. And uh, actually uh, it mirrors in um, uh, the, the difference in growth spurts in males and females. So girls have an earlier uh, peak, but it's lower. Males have a higher, uh, a later peak, um, but it's higher. And so there's long been a, a thought that um, osteosarcoma has to somehow be related to, um, to puberty. Uh, there has been at least some analytic epidemiology in, in osteosarcoma, uh, which has only um, turned up uh, two environmental risk factors. So uh, prior irradiation, meaning therapeutic irradiation and, and primer, pri, uh, prior chemotherapy with alkylating agents. Uh, and these are absolutely confirmed, but um, also very, uh, very rare exposures. Um, so if any of you saw the movie Radium Girls or read the book, uh, the radium watchdial painters is a, a classic of epidemiology. The radium is a, a, a actually um, chemically similar to calcium, except that it's radioactive. And so the radiation would, um, radium would deposit the bones. And, and for those who didn't die of uh, acute radiation poisoning, uh, they would get osteosarcoma at, at incredibly elevated rates. But um, more to the point, there are uh, endogenous risk factors. So um, uh, uh, puberty and just uh, age, uh, having an age around puberty is, is a risk factor. And then there is a small but detectable association with height, um, albeit it's, it's, it's not as large as you might think. So um, we have turned to genetics again to explain um, incidence of osteosarcoma. And in 2013, we published a GWAS, which uh, as the title says, identified uh, two susceptibility loci. Um, I don't have any slide to show you because we've been sitting on the data for the last couple of years. But as this GWAS has gotten larger, uh, actually these, these, uh, these uh, associations have lost significance and um, oddly, the larger the study gets, the harder it has been to find anything that uh, any common SNP that is um, uh, associated with osteosarcoma at the, the genome-wide level. Um, and we've done heritability estimation SNP-based, and it's pretty low, well under 10%. Uh, and, and so um, this is a bit of a puzzle, although I think that it's pointing to something I will uh, tell you in a second. Um, we have also looked at uh, um, uh, genetic determinants of, of growth traits. And so um, this one's in preparation, um, but we've looked at uh, 
association with um, genetically determined birth weight. Uh, and you can see that there is a little bit of a, um, uh, uh, a dose response. And, um, you know, this suggests that uh, uh, osteosarcoma may in fact have uh, an in utero uh, origin. Um, surprisingly, height has not been associated, sorry, genetically predicted height has not been associated with uh, osteosarcoma in our sample, uh, unless the child had a uh, pathogenic um, uh, germline cancer variant. Speaking of which, um, our attention has moved now more towards um, rare variation. So in a study of uh, exomes of patients, we found that uh, up to one third of, uh, of um, patients have uh, a pathogenic or likely pathogenic mutation in the classic uh, cancer susceptibility gene. Think P53 or uh, BRCA1 uh, or, or the like. Um, what's interesting is um, the most associated one, P53, uh, only uh, slightly more than 5% of um, patients have mutations there. Instead, it's, it's mutations in a whole panoply of genes, which can kind of give the, the genes, um, make them poised, uh, sorry, make the cells poised to have a, a second hit um, in the, in, in the um, bone cells. Uh, I want to add that we uh, have, um, that there's an absolute disconnect between um, the data showing uh, a third of patients have uh, pathogenic or likely pathogenic mutations and the percent of patients that have a family history. And consequently, we looked at uh, some um, trios that we have cases and parents with exome data in, um, to, to see if there were a, a higher prevalence of de novo mutations uh, in osteosarcoma patients. And what we found was um, that uh, nearly half of the kids who had P53 mutations did not inherit it from their parents. In other words, it was uh, de novo, um, and suggesting that um, one reason that we you know, don't see family history in the majority of cases is that they're inheriting these um, uh, mutations uh, with, without a family history. Um, but that means for the two thirds of cases that have uh, you know, no pathogenic or likely pathogenic um, germline mutation, there's also no uh, real um, polygenic uh, architecture to speak of, uh, apart from those related to growth traits. And um, this suggests that uh, osteosarcoma may be a paradigmatic example of uh, a cancer caused mainly by chance. And uh, actually, um, I go back to 2015, uh, there was a paper by Tomasetti and Vogelstein, which looked at, uh, um, which basically declared uh, uh, cancer as a function of the number of stem cell divisions. Uh, and that got translated in the lay press to, to cancer as a function of, of bad luck. Uh, and you'll notice in the lower left-hand corner is uh, of different types of uh, different locales of osteosarcoma. I would add that, uh, Osteosarcoma um, is a cancer caused uh, at the cellular level by chromothripsis, which is a shattering and, and reconstituting of uh, genes in, um, in somatic cells. Uh, and you can see osteosarcoma is one of the cancers where this is the most um, common. Um, and then finally, this is a paper from our group in press I note that uh, the, the uh, international incidence uh, kind of mirrors this thought that osteosarcoma is mostly a matter of bad luck. Uh, we have the same rate, just to pick in uh, three disparate locales, uh, more or less the same rate and pattern of incidence in North America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Southeastern Asia. We also showed that um, over a 30-year time span uh, that the rate hasn't really changed uh, anywhere. Uh, except significantly in, in Southern Europe. So I'm going to move on and I'm going to blast through this one to leave some time. Um, hepatoblastoma is now an odd case where uh, our um, genetic studies have actually revealed uh, a uh, environment 
environmental or endogenous exposure. So um, hepatoblastoma is, is probably the rarest tumor that, that one could actually um, study epidemiologically, uh, and I have for the last 20 years. Um, but what we noticed in the last couple of years is that uh, the incidence seems to be rising faster than uh, any other cancer. And we quantified this in IARC data um, and showed that uh, indeed, in most areas of the world, hepatoblastoma had the highest rate of um, increase uh, for any cancer under five. Now, obviously, a cancer does not increase um, across the world in diverse regions and, um, uh, and diverse background genetics uh, without there being some environmental cause. Um, and so we started to think, uh, what could that be? I previously and others have shown that um, hepatoblastoma uh, is um, vastly more common in children who have very low birth weight. So the, the estimates on in um, Asia, so Japan and China, as well as uh, Europe and the UK and Nordic countries and the US, and then there's an unpublished study in Brazil, uh, show that um, the relative risk of hepatoblastoma is uh, you know, many fold in kids with uh, very low birth weights, variously defined. Um, you know, it, 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 it is true that prematurity has gone up around the globe, but uh, I'm not sure that survival from prematurity has, um, has risen. And uh, also not uh, certain that uh, treatment for prematurity is, is um, the same in, in all these different locales. And so that seemed uh, a um, inadequate uh, explanation. Uh, I showed the other year that uh, um, in vitro fertilization, conception by in vitro fertilization raised the risk of uh, hepatic cancers, mainly hepatoblastoma. Um, but this too seems like an inadequate uh, explanation. Uh, I know of no nation where um, IVF uh, comprises more than uh, two or three percent of, of births. We did learn in the last few years that um, uh, uh, birth defects, structural birth defects, are far more common in um, pediatric uh, cancer than previously suspected. So this again is from a, a colleague in Texas, Philip Lupo, um, and you read this heat map this way. Here we have class of birth defect, and here we have class of tumor. And if you look at hepatoblastoma in this heat map, uh, it's got the strongest um, and most widespread uh, association with structural birth defects. Um, but then we looked at uh, the distribution of birth defects around the world, and um, you know they are uh, perhaps being detected more, but uh, not necessarily becoming more common. So uh, we've turned again to genetics, conducting uh, GWAS in um, uh, starting with U.S. samples, uh, uh, almost 800. And then uh, collaborators on the world have donated a, a replication set of almost 130 cases. And uh, to our surprise in the first phase, so there, there will be some updates to this and publication soon, we got an extremely strong hit, both in the statistical significance uh, and effect size sense. So that odds ratio would be two per allele. And this was in a gene called BCL11A. Of course, I started hitting the, the databases to understand what this might be. Uh, I should add that uh, they, the effect seems to uh, replicate transethnically. And BCL11A is a um, glucose responsive transcription factor. Uh, and when I plugged it into the UK Biobank uh, Phenome Wide Association um, uh, browser, actually, the phenotype that was most associated was. Uh, male pattern baldness. Uh, I actually debuted this in a, in a parent conference of hepatoblastoma um, patients and parents, and, and believe it or not, all, all the dads were bald, um, which was puzzling until I looked up on Wikipedia what causes uh, balding. Turns out it's an interaction between um, androgens and the Wnt signaling pathway. Uh, and so that gave me some surface plausibility to the, the phenotype association. Wind signaling is, um, is intimately uh, involved in the causation of um, leukemia, oh, sorry, hepatoblastoma. Uh, Wind signaling is, is somatically mutated in hepatoblastoma. But um, even more exciting, we know that BCL11A 
is a regulator of fetal hemoglobin expression. Why is that exciting? Well, um, you may not know it, but uh, actually blood is produced in the liver uh, in, in um, middle of uh, gestation. And so that certainly places the action of this gene uh, in the liver in utero. And even more interestingly, uh, BCL11A is a, a diabetes risk gene. Uh, um, expression of BCL11A is inversely associated with um, insulin expression. And so um, I now think that our GWAS has inadvertently identified uh, an environmental or behavioral risk factor for um, hepatoblastoma. That can explain the international uh, rising rate. Um, and that is uh, maternal obesity and um, di diabetes, both pre-existing and gestational, which have been documented to be rising um, across the world uh, and, and would provide uh, a um, prevalent and plausible risk factor. I also went back and hit the epidemiologic literature. So there is one study that looked at um, maternal obesity uh, or uh, BMI as recorded on um, birth certificates and there, there is a, a pretty strong association here. So to answer the question I posed in my ambitious uh, title, um, I think that we are uh, closing in on, on the question and it's gonna vary by tumor. There undoubtedly is some environmental input, but it's far less than I would have expected when I first started in this business. There undoubtedly is uh, genetic uh, causes both a uh, rare pathogenic variation, but a surprisingly strong association with um, polygenic uh, common SNPs. Um, and there is going to be some um, major discoveries, I think, in the coming years about genetic differences between ancestral groups uh, that, that uh, modify risk. And then lastly, I think osteosarcoma is a paradigmatic case, but uh, we can't discount the, the role of, of sheer chance. In, in causing pediatric cancer. So uh, I, I think I almost uh, left 10 minutes for questions. So now I'm happy to take them. Excellent, that was fascinating. We do have a number of questions coming in. Can you hear me, Logan? I can. Okay, great. Um, let's see here. Uh, so Aaron Folsom, you said that because many normal kids have risky alleles, there must be environmental contributors, but couldn't the low penetrance couldn't it be low penetrance and still genetic? Um, yes, could be very low penetrance. I think ALL is, um, you know, uh, all the GWAS SNPs, the common SNPs, they're, they're not pointing towards anything environmental. They are um, mostly uh, involved in uh, transcription factors that, that, um, that contribute to, to differentiation of, of B cells. And so uh, I don't think that's pointing to anything um, uh, environmental. I, I think actually, ironically, the, the rarest cancer, hepatoblastoma, like I said, that that's implicating maternal um, glucose metabolism. And uh, so, you know, ironically, it has, uh, it, it has implicated something. I, I don't like to call it obesity environmental exactly, but uh, it behavioral um, or um, modifiable endogenous, yeah. David asked how much adult cancer originates in utero. Uh, that's, that's a great question. I don't think anybody's put a, a um, exact number on it, but uh, there are quite a few hints towards that, you know, starting with birth weight associations with breast and prostate and, and colon cancer. Um, and so we're obviously very interested in that as well, but it's not as easy to study because the the time span between birth and, and development of the disease is decades instead of a couple of years. Mark, I, I, I took your prerogative. No problem. Um, I'm thinking about this interesting question here from Abby Johnson on the microbiome. People are starting to look at the microbiome and the role of, of, of pediatric cancers. Do you have any um, uh, thoughts on that? Yeah. So uh, actually, people have started to look at microbiome in, in pediatric cancer, but it's, it's impossible to, to do it validly in the retrospective way, right? Because um, there aren't too many, 
there are no cohort studies or at least active participation cohort studies. You know, we have record linkage cohort studies. But, you know, um, to, to think that you would collect a stool on millions of uh, mothers and children to, to look at um, pediatric cancer outcomes, it's, it's just not feasible. There are mouse models, though, that have suggested that um, uh, in genetically predisposed mice, manipulating the microbiome uh, changes the risk. Um, and we would love to look at it, but there's just a, a, you know, only so many study designs you can you use uh, with uh, very rare diseases. So it's, it's interesting, but also very difficult to study in humans. Yeah, and David Jacobs circles back to diet. Um, do these findings lead uh, to any thought about novel ways in which postnatal exposures like diet might affect cancer. I guess the question is not just about diet, but I get frustrated too because as you say, the rare cancers are so difficult to study and diet is very difficult to measure, especially with this question. So maybe maybe some thoughts, more thoughts on diet. Um, yeah. Yeah. So um, there have been case control studies and, you know, I share your frustration with say FFQs, but uh, we've tried to look at, you know, um, general dietary pattern rather than specific nutrients. And, um, you know, there is, there is uh, some fair consistency looking at m like maternal prenatal vitamin use and uh, the general healthiness of a diet. You know, not surprisingly, if, if you eat your dark green leafy vegetables, that seems to be associated with um, lower risk. Um, more specifically, people concentrated on folate, you know, uh, maybe 15, 20 years ago. But uh, at least when we measure it in newborn blood spots, those are the only nested samples we have consistent access to. There didn't seem to be much of a, a difference. And, you know, when I think people, a few people have tried um, maybe proto-Mendelian randomization of, of folate metabolism, that also hasn't turned up much. So diet's very difficult. But I will say, Sir Mel Greaves, who, who kind of uh, broke the story of um, prenatal evidence of prenatal um, carcinogenesis for leukemia, he's, he's going to attempt a trial of uh, microbiome uh, manipulation. I like to say he's, he's going to feed a bunch of kids a, a mango lassi because he, he calls it his yogurt drink. So, um, you know, there, <laughs> people are starting to, to talk about prevention. And uh, um, I'm uh, absolutely, uh, you know, um, on board. I think though that we're, we're never going to make it population wide uh, because of the rarity. But um, what we're working on now is taking the SNPs, taking um, the perinatal risk factors and trying to weave them together into a, um, a risk profile that, that may find a, um, you know, a targetable group uh, with enough incidents to, to um, justify um, either following them for screening or uh, actually coming up with an intervention. I think in terms of order of things, we have to do the natural history study prospectively first before we try the interventions. Shayla's wondering about um, epigenetics and if, if you've used that model to, to answer some of your questions. Again, very difficult in a, in a um, prospective manner. Uh, there is a consortium that, that pools childhood cohort studies and they're gonna be looking at longitudinal epigenome, um, albeit they, they've pooled together maybe 2 million kids, which means uh, a couple hundred leukemias and very few solid tumors. Um, but we are starting to uh, um, look at um, epigenetics in the newborn blood spots and um, I think that's going to end up being very illuminating. Sorry, we don't have anything further yet. And then Kristen, who uh, this must be a plant question since he's my postdoc. Um, do you think that you'll be able to do G by E interaction with how rare hepatoblastoma is to get at the BMI gene question? Um, rather than looking at uh, gene by environment interaction, we're certainly going to attempt it, but I think the, the um, it has to be a very favorable scenario for that to work, but um, we do have very robust, um, you know, SNPs related to, to BMI, so we're just going to go directly to Mendelian randomization to, to answer that question. 
Yeah, the hepatoblastoma story is really, really fascinating. Um, I went immediately to thinking about, you know, fatty liver becoming more common at younger ages, and then you get into the obesity and the diabetes. That's a really interesting story. It is, yeah. So the, look, look to that to hopefully come out this fall. Great. Thank you so much. You're at the top of the hour. Um, this, was, this was fascinating. Um, really, really interesting, important work. Appreciate everybody's attendance, especially over the course of the semester. Um, I think these seminars have gone really well. Um, appreciate the help of Jeff Johnson and, and the rest of the EPI computer support group and Barb Lux for her administrative help with all of the scheduling and advertising. And you'll be in great hands moving forward next fall with Ruby Wynn, uh, Professor, uh, Assistant Professor Ruby Wynn taking over as the seminar director. So I hope you all have a, have a great summer. Thank you. Thanks for having me.